right. So this past week, I've actually been uh, reading up on a new book, been putting together a proposal for a conference, and figured I would do some research by reading Homo Ludens by Johan Huizinga. Now, I'm probably mispronouncing that name, but um, it's a Dutch name, so I'm not that familiar with it. <laughs> Overall, I found, though, I found the book to be uh, fascinating. It, it's genuinely one of the more fascinating books that I've read in a while, and there's a few things about it that I think... Um, are quite interesting and useful for understanding several elements <laughs> that, that I've really been trying to put some words together for. Um, sort of the first fun thing, um, I will put my notes uh, within the description uh, that includes a full, a full PDF for you to go over. So if you want to double check what I'm saying and make sure that I'm not giving you any spin or bunk, you can go and check it out yourself for free. Um, but the first fun thing, and the thing that I think most people would find interesting, is that there is actually a direct reference to Homo Ludens, the book, through the works of uh, Hideo Kojima. It is genuinely, if you go to the Kojima Productions page, um, and then go to the company page, it has a message from studio founder Hideo, Hideo Kojima. Um, and on there you can see their, their company uh, mascot logo, um, which uh, that character's name is Ludens in a direct reference to the book. And then there are several parts within the actual message itself that stood out to me because I was like, holy shit, that, that was taken directly from the book. So uh, primarily the first line, from Sapiens to Ludens, we are Homo Ludens, those who play. Uh, it, and then later on when he says, playing is not simply a pastime, it is the primordial basis of imagination and creation. Truth be told, Homo Ludens, those who play, are simultaneously Homo Favor, those who create. Um, and that actually directly relates to a section, uh, to a portion in the foreword of the book where it says quote there is a third function however applicable to both human and animal life and just as important as reasoning and making namely playing it seems to me that next to homo faber and perhaps on the same level as homo sapiens homo ludens man the player deserves a place in our nomenclature so i don't know how uh, kojima came across the idea but clearly he he has some familiarity uh, with the book, whether or not it was like uh, he actually read the whole thing or somebody told him about it or he came across sort of a summary. I don't know. <laughs> like, There's not enough uh, information to really uh, sit down and uh, I'm sure there is some interview out there where he goes into far, far more detail about that. Uh, but I, I've just got other things I got to look into. So <laughs> uh, Somebody else could do the research. I'm sure there's somebody else who, who has done the research. I can't be the only person who put that together. Um, but overall, uh, I do I do want to touch mostly on the book, and this is sort of me just after reading the book, um, kind of digesting it. Uh, it's it's been it's been a couple days since I actually finished it. I've gotten all my notes down, and then I've just had uh, a couple days to sort of bounce around a few things. So this is not really a review, not really a full digestion it's more me rambling <laughs> uh, rambling about what i read and what i found interesting about it uh, as well as a few quotes I've, uh, I've got a few here now the the first thing the first thing is really that um it's it's an anthropological book um and nobody i should have expected that but it was also the same thing of like nothing in the description really talked about like how much it would it would spend going over cultural artifacts and and history of of um like cultural well cultural artifacts uh various practices and traditions and whatnot and showing that this is not only a principle that Oizinga found but that there is a consistent <laughs> There is a very, very consistent record of this. Um, and I mean, it's it's through all factors. It can be very, very dry in the first portion. I found that to be the case for myself where <laughs> I would just read a section and I'd go like, oh, okay, okay. But so basically once you get to the end, it, it all works. It, it It's like, okay, so first I'm gonna show you how this uh, pops up here. And that's pretty cool. 
Now, if you think it pops up there, what about here? Oh, what about here? What about here? By the time you get to the end, you're like, dude, there's, there's, there's so much evidence of the idea that he's trying to put forward that it, it really is hard to, um, hard to say that he's outright wrong. There might be little uh, things here and there, maybe that he's oversimplifying uh, various parts of the, the record, but uh, by the end of it, it's like, nope, nope, I am not smart enough to be able to tell you that you have done this all wrong. Um, the the big thing, the, the big element that Huizinga is essentially trying to get across in this book is that play, um, play as a concept is not just an artifact of general rationality or instinct or will or any of these things, but that play is something f uh, more fundamental. And we can see this, uh, the example he gives right from the beginning is that play is a thing that occurs in both humans and animals. And you don't have to teach, uh, say a dog, a wolf, uh, a cat uh, to play. It just knows how to play, which might make you think it's an instinct, but it seems to be more fundamental than that once you try to define what play is in relation to anything else. Um, and the big, the big outcome of that, and the reason it's so important for understanding humans and human society and human culture is because we, we've made an art form out of it. Um, and that art form is essentially what led to the creation of almost everything in, in the very beginning of culture. It is not specifically that that play, um, that that culture creates play, or that culture grows from play, but that culture and play are actually more connected than we tend to think. That many of the things we do within um, within society has this core of a, a play element that might not be obvious on its face because we don't treat it as play, but there is something about it that is play and. Uh, he goes through example upon example upon example in um, poetry. Poetry is the plane of words, the plane of images, the plane of beat and rhythm. Music is an even more pure form of that. Dancing is um, all of these elements being uh, manifested within uh, bodily movement. The uh, competition, the ritualistic competition that comes from play. Uh, starts to manifest itself in legal procedures, in war, in many, many of these other factors. And there's a lot where Oizinga actually does sit down and say, hey, um, not all of this is play. Not everything is play, but you can find play in almost everything. Um, <coughs> so generally the, the structure of the book, it does start with um, archaic society, so generally very, very early societies of, say, the Algonquins, um, Greece, Rome, um, China, um, several African, uh, several different African nations, um, and Arabic. Generally, there is quite a uh, quite a wide examination of many different cultures that were generally not connected. Um, but I, I've gotten here sort of a few quotes. Um, the first, uh, quote, now in myth and ritual, the great instinctive forces of civilized life have their origin, law and order, commerce and profit, craft and art, poetry, wisdom and science, all are rooted in the primeval soil of play. So what I was talking about earlier in that culture, culture doesn't exactly come out of play, culture and play are uh, completely connected. Now, one of the big things that, that tends to get reiterated in the book, and I think it's actually quite useful, um, is that he, he's very clear in that play, uh, play is not the opposite of seriousness. Um, people tend to, to view them as such. If somebody is playing, obviously they're not serious, but that's, that's far from the truth. And I believe he says it best here. Quote, uh, we can say play is non-seriousness, but apart from the fact that this prop, uh, proposition tells us nothing about the positive qualities of play, it is extraordinarily easy to refute. As soon as we proceed from play is non-seriousness to play is not serious, the contrast leaves us in the lurch. For some play can be very serious indeed. Moreover, we can immediately name several other fundamental categories that likewise come under the heading non-seriousness, yet have no correspondence whatsoever with play. 
Laughter, for instance, is in a sense the opposite of seriousness without being absolutely bound up with play. Children's games, football, and chess are played in profound seriousness. The players have not the slightest inclination to laugh. It is worth noting that the purely physiological act of laughing is exclusive to man, whilst the significant function of play is common to both men and animals. The Aristotelian animal characterizes man as distinct from the animal almost more absolutely than Homo sapiens. Now, again, then that idea kind of it pops up again and again and again, because usually when you're talking about something like legal matters or war, you're talking about something that most people tend to look at and go, but that's a serious thing. There's no way that that play is connected with it. And Oizinga really wants the reader to understand that, no, 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 just because something is serious doesn't mean there isn't play involved. Um, if anybody has been in any sort of competitive game with a friend, you take it seriously. You want to win. Um, and this element of play is, is usually ignored when people are trying to define what play is and just how uh, significant it is to culture. So it's a very important point to uh, keep in mind overall. The other things he does is he sort of um, categorizes different elements of play, what, what denotes play and what doesn't, um, which uh, the big thing, a big thing that continually pops up is that uh, play, play may be easy to define, although it also may not. Uh, there are several notes that he makes of that. But um, one of the interesting things about play is that there is really no opposite of play. Again, we can't say seriousness is the opposite of play because, well, play can be serious. So if we say earnestness, um, it, it, play doesn't really have an analog. I mean, there are certainly things that fall out of play, but their falling out of play seems to be an affectation of something else. We essentially remove play from something, not that play itself has become an opposite. In other words, there's play and there's not play. The same activity can be play or not play. You could do the same thing and have the element of play, but also not have the element of play. Overall, though, by the time you get to sort of the later chapters, well, the essential idea of the book is to show how play and culture relate and how important play was for the formation of culture and sort of the continuation of many of the cultural elements that, that we continue to keep. But by the time you get to the last two sections, Huizenga is is more concerned that we're in a world where play is continually being pushed out for this new, this overall new construction. And he has a hard time defining it, but he can certainly point to elements and say, this does not feel like play. Something has changed. Um, and it should be noted that uh, by the time he wrote the book, this was during the time that uh, Nazi Germany was uh, established in power and uh, the Soviet Union was established in power. And he wrote about both. Um, he wrote about both within the book, but um, probably the one of the better paragraphs that explains his, his worry here is, um, quote, closely akin to this, if at a slightly deeper psychological level, is the insatiable thirst for trivial recreation and crude sensationalism, the delight in mass meetings, mass demonstrations, parades, etc. The club is a very ancient institution, but it is a disaster when whole nations turn into clubs. For these, besides promoting the precious qualities of friendship and loyalty, are also hotbeds of sectarianism, intolerance, suspicion, superciliousness, and quick to defend any illusion that flatters self-love or group consciousness. We have seen great nations losing every shred of honor, all sense of humor, the very idea of decency and fair play. And uh, that one's kind of coded around paragraphs where he's talking about the... Um, <laughs> Right, it was the paragraph just before that he was talking about Boy Scoutism turned turned into warfare. <laughs> Which, eh, kind of an obvious illusion there. Um, now, overall, like, this was very, very interesting. This was a very interesting book, and honestly, I could spend uh, a lot more time diving into it. But yeah, I suppose it'd be good to step back and and go like, well, why did I like it? What, what elements 
did I get out of it? Um, the first is that very early on and throughout the book, there is this continuing idea of uh, the cheat in the spoil sport. Very early on, he goes over the idea that there is um, those who play, those who cheat, and those who spoil the game. And what's very interesting is um, those who play, play in earnest, those who cheat, acknowledge the game and they acknowledge the rules, but they're they're more playing with them. They're more they're not breaking the game entirely, but they're more bending the rules or looking for an unfair advantage. But they're still playing the game, and as such, we're actually a little more um, understandable of this. Whereas in a spoil sport, is somebody who either directly uh, directly goes against the rules of the game to such a degree that it, it um, provokes a visceral reaction in us, or they unintentionally point out that we are in the game. They, they spoil the game by not letting the game exist in its own space, but by destroying the illusion in some way. Um, this actually, uh, it puts into context, last week I was talking about the ideation of ideas and sort of a, a rambling on why, why modern conversation seems to be so weird in that speaking with people is is like speaking to multiple layers of inbuilt beliefs and understandings that is very very difficult to to push through to any significant uh, significant degree and one of the elements that i brought up about that was typically the i i find myself in conversations where um, we seem to be having a normal conversation, and then instantly it transforms. It, something is said, something is done, where it goes from a normal conversation to suddenly something, some switch has been hit. And understanding it in this way, I actually somewhat understand that more. Um, because in some sense, to the other person, or to myself, depending on the conversation, um, one of us has spoiled the game in a way. And probably the, the best example of this uh, is a personal conversation I had with a family member at one point. Um, this was during a, a, particular, a particular gathering. Uh, and I don't know, one of my family members was um, going on about uh, various uh, political ideas, uh, various ideas that, uh, for the most part, I was just sort of uh, just going to listen to, chill with. Um, but they said one in particular where they said uh, we should jail and uh, jail and kick out of the country anybody who burns the flag. And it was uh, at that point I was just sort of like, okay, hang on, nope, I I don't. I think that's a very dangerous idea. You start implementing that, it produces all sorts of legal problems and it starts to undermine one of the fundamental uh, aspects that we have in the United States. Uh, it instantly, it, it went from just, they were generally talking to people to instantly screaming at me. Like, top of their lungs. It started saying some stuff that I could not have predicted where it was suddenly, that I hate America, I, I want the country to be destroyed, I'm actually an anarchist, I hate the veterans, I hate the police. Um, I, I did, like, it was just all sorts of stuff where I was like, where is this coming from? Um, to me, it was it was so out of left field that I, for for the longest time, I'm just like, what, what even happened? It, it was literally zero to 100. Everyone was chill, talking, no one seemed to be upset. I just sort of gave a little bit of pushback and it, it it just it became something else but now with the context of, of what I read here there, I think I'm getting a bit of the idea I spoiled the game <laughs> uh, which is a very very weird way of saying it but the, the context of what was happening was not they weren't expecting, first off, they weren't expecting anybody to, to really go like, oh, I disagree. So there's there's violation one, which in and of itself might be um, might be tolerable, but in, com uh, in combination with element two, which is that specifically what I said went against a, a very, very core value, which 
I didn't think those values were connected, but for them, um, to to burn the flag is not just like a, a form of speech. It is legitimately this uh, this message of such a deep and deep rooted hatred of um, America and values that it has that combined with the fact that I had also provided pushback, I had, I had broken the rules of the game enough that I had broken sort of the illusion of the game. And the game there was more, um, I'm just gonna say my opinions and we're gonna nod and move along with it. Uh, I didn't realize that game was going at the time. That was, that was what I had waded into. I had made the mistake of breaking the illusion of the game. And in the context of that, that that explains a lot, especially with this person, with it, with that person specifically. It was um, very much they they operated on these sorts of levels a lot, where um, it, a big rule of the game was I'm allowed to say what I say, but you're not allowed to say what you say. <laughs> there's a there's a reason I don't I don't uh, interact with uh, that that part of my family anymore. <laughs> I'll just say that. And then another thing, another thing about why I uh, found the book quite interesting and why I think it is quite relevant um, is that when you get to the section on uh, war and then when you get to the section on sort of uh, the play element in 19th and 20th century, um, there there's a couple there's a couple things that that sort of pop up. Where I'm like, oh, that that sounds relevant. Um, a good one is the idea that as time went on, the the sort of sh uh, chivalrous ideas of war, the the honor of war, um, which occurred not only in Europe but also occurred in the Middle East and it occurred um, in China. The, these general ideas of honorary war. Um, as time went on, honorary war got sort of supplanted, um, taken over by the idea of international law. Um, we, we moved the battleground from one to the other, um, meeting on the battleground and having an honorable duel or an honorable battle um, was no longer in vogue. Battle overall uh, started to become less popular, but the legal battle the, the battle that happens within uh, the, the front of international law became far more palatable. Um, it's not that the play element disappeared in this, but it transformed. It moved to a different arena, but it also introduced a new problem. Um, a new problem in that what happens when somebody refuses that system. Um, and he, he has a pretty good portion here on that. Quote, Things have now come to such a pass that the system of international law is no longer acknowledged or observed as the very basis of culture and civilized living. As soon as one member or more of a community of states virtually denies the binding character of international law and either in practice or in theory proclaims the interests and power of its own group, be it nation, party, class, church, or whatsoever else, as the sole norm of its political behavior, not only does the last vestige of the immemorial play spirit vanish, but with it any claim to civilization at all. Society then sinks down to the level of the barbaric, and original violence retakes its ancient rights." So <clears throat> there's a pretty good thought here in, in that um, you could set up the new system, and that can be the, the preferred sort of play arena. But overall, <laughs> What can happen is that somebody, you get a, a member state or a group within a member state or what have you that just sort of says, no, we, we don't, we don't care. <laughs> we're, not, we're not following your rules. We're not following. We're going to play the game our way. Um, but that then that ruins the game. They've, they've moved, they've de uh, denigrated back into something that no one else is willing to play with. And probably the, the two conflicts that are most relevant for this right now are um, Ukraine, Russia, and Israel, Hamas. Um, these two conflicts right now are um, very, very heated. And depending on who you talk to, there is kind of an element in there where people are talking about um, the other side spoiling the game. So, <coughs> for instance, um, 
it's usually that Russia or NATO or Hamas or Israel are blatantly ignoring international law. And again, it depends on who you ask, um, but the, the justification for what people do, uh, for, for what a nation might do. Um, in the instance of Ukraine, it's that Russia illegally invaded. They flagrantly violated international law and decided to engage in a territorial war. Um, but if you talk to people on the Russian side, they, they'll say like NATO ignored uh, original trade agreements and flagrantly violated international law with the expansion of NATO and um, the, the, I don't know, there was something about secret soldiers in, in Ukraine, the Euromaidan, sorry. Um, everything with the Euromaidan was a violation, a coup, um, you know, Nazis within Ukraine. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of justification towards the idea that um, Russia says Ukraine violated international law or NATO violated international law, and therefore they, they're completely in the right to do what they do. They have the self-defense, whereas in Ukraine also says that, um, Russia violated international law. Now, over time, <laughs> over time, uh, obviously the one, uh, one party is going to win out, uh, win out over the other. And I will be honest here; I'm not trying to say that both sides are equally, um, equally justified. I am generally, I am almost entirely on the side of Ukraine on this one. Um, I am, I am absolutely not for Russian expansionism and uh, sort of this, this growing Soviet. I suppose the the idea is more the like Soviet reclamation, Soviet worship, this this general like growth of the USSR being the the good old days of Russia. I am generally very very fear, fearful of that being um, <laughs> being a playing factor within the international sphere. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying that Russia is justified. I am I I do not believe they are justified. But if uh, if you go and you ask them, they're going to say they're justified because the other side flagrantly ignored international law. And so that that, that context of, well, they spoiled the game. Uh, the whole concept of the spoil sport keeps popping up on some level. So part of what Huizinga uh, brings up when it comes to the spoil sport, it is somewhat of a useful little... Uh, lens to sort of determine what is the seriousness. Still kind of an interesting way of, of looking at potential conflicts within the world and sort of how the game is played. Um, though this does, uh, this does bring me to my next point, which is actually that while I, while I thoroughly enjoyed this book, while I found it to be um, quite insightful to read, I don't think it provides like a really robust lens of analysis. I think there there are several elements. Like I said, the the spoil sport uh, element might be useful in some cases for determining like why do people care so much. <laughs> um, but for the most part, this isn't really one of those all encompassing um, analytical lenses that you can really go to uh, one thing or the other and just instantly know what's going on because uh, of the book. But um, it does provide another uh, tool to the chest. And more specifically, again, little elements might be able to be extracted. So, um, for example, what are the rules of the game? Now, any sort of more, uh, more robust analysis of any particular thing, like if you look into any single conflict, you might be able to start with going, okay, are people following the rules when it comes to this conflict? Uh, if not, who's violating them, so on and so forth. But now you see you're you're getting out of the play element. You're now getting into a, an analysis of international law and specifically what is international law, what violates international law, that sort of thing. Um, so it's it might be a useful jumping off board for for determining little things here and there. But I don't. <laughs> It's, it's not a full encompassing lens that you, you try to put on everything, you know, like some other, like some other um, uh, particular analytical tools try to do. And actually, uh, I think Huizinga himself was, was actually, he seemed to be uh, pretty, pretty against the idea of an all encompassing lens overall. <laughs> I mean, he, he took a pretty good swipe at uh, Marx towards the later half of the book. It's actually a pretty good quote. It says, uh, 
quote, as a result of this luxation of our intellects, the shameful misconception of Marxism could be put about and even believed that economic forces and material interests determine the course of the world. This grotesque overestimation of the economic factor was conditioned by our worship of technological progress, which was itself the fruit of rationalism and utilitarianism after they had killed the mysteries and acquitted man of guilt and sin. <laughs> But they had forgotten to free him of folly and myopia, and he only seemed uh, he seemed only to fit the mold the world after the pattern of his own banality. So, it, it there's a couple other paragraphs where where Huizinga actually takes like some pretty sharp uh, sharp shots at at various sorts of oh you're interpreting the world in this. He doesn't seem to be a big fan of um, like condensing the world into a single lens as is. Um, which, uh, at the time, it was very popular to do that with uh, Marxism. It's still fairly popular among uh, certain people to just sort of like, ev everything is, is material, uh, is analyzed through materialism. And, and it, when I say materialism, I'm not talking like a material universe. I'm talking like economic materialism, that everything is about the material conditions of the people and so on and so forth. There are people who still sort of apply this as as a end all be all analysis of every single thing. I'm I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, Hoisinga doesn't seem to be a big fan of that. So when it comes to utilizing his his understanding of the play element, when it comes to looking at that, finding that in culture, um, I I personally don't think it's something that you can use to just sort of analyze every every little aspect of culture. Um, and there are several times where Hoisinga actually does uh, make it very clear of like, okay. <laughs> Here's, here's where the play element is, but this is something that like play could be happening. It might not be. It's a case by case basis and you have to kind of figure that out. So that is a note about reading this. It's not one of those books you're going to read and it's like, oh, I figured out everything. The, the whole universe makes it. No, but it is. But, but um, it is a good companion to several other writers. And in particular, uh, there was recently I reread um, Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, uh, mostly, mostly because my buddy had decided to read it, and it'd been like three, 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 four years since I last read it, and I was like, "Hang on, I gotta reread this just to make sure that I, I like, I have this down," um, because I don't know, I was hearing some wild stuff. Um, generally, though, the 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 concept of the geneal genealogy of morals is. Or this this contest, this competition between um, how morals come about, and I think reading this book alongside that uh, would be a, a pretty good companion because uh, much of what Nietzsche was talking about in in like the the battle between master morality and slave morality actually it seems to fit a lot of what Hoisinga is talking about in that um, sort of ritualistic combat between um, ideas and peoples it, it seems to be an idea that is just constantly recurring and he does have a section uh, called playforms in philosophy which he even re uh, reedifies it there <laughs> where, where he specifically says that some uh, I think it was some of the biographers of Nietzsche um blamed him for bringing back the Greek agonistic attitude in philosophy. If he has done so, he has re, uh, reinserted the roots of philosophy. <laughs> um, so, it, I don't know. It It's one of those things where if you're generally, if you're familiar with Nietzsche, you might actually find this to be a, a pretty interesting companion piece in that Nietzsche is very, very um, specifically focused on sort of philology and and um, philosophy, whereas in Moisinga is focused on cultural history and anthropology. Um, so I do think they, they serve as a good companion. Uh, they serve as good companions to one another. Not perfect companions, but uh, that's pretty much the biggest reason why I would suggest anybody to read this. Not as its own standalone lens to just sort of understand the world, but in relation to other philosophical works, this actually does provide a very interesting um, set of set of anthropological evidences for various philosophical ideas, and especially Nietzsche's ideas. And I think that's essentially all I have to say about this this book. Um, like I said, this this has been 
the big thing I've been working on this week. I still need to put the proposal together for the conference. Um, I'm gonna actually start doing this regularly where uh, I'll try to get a book done each week. I might not. It really depends. This this weekend is gonna be all sorts of interesting. But um, I could set that up as a goal for myself. Be a good way of spending the summer, <laughs> at least. That's pretty much all I have to say this time. Uh, we'll see what happens over the next week. It might be about a different book or it might be about different topics that I come across. Uh, who knows? I, I really have no plan for any of this. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thanks for sticking around this long. Um, as is, uh, I hope you have a good one. <laughs>